Thank you so much for joining us. I've got Steen with me today, and we're going to be talking about the more positive, uplifting side of AI and how it can be used for the good of the Earth as well as humanity. But before I dive into the questions that I've got for you, can you give everybody a quick intro? Yeah, Emma, thanks for, for having me on. Um, you build such great content and um, just thrilled to be a part of that. Um, me personally, I'm the, the CEO of a, a startup in the AI space that we're currently in stealth. And I recently you know, spent the last 15 years of my career um, at Intel, and I had the unique opportunity to participate with a tremendous amount of ecosystem partners on deploying computing into the physical world and um, kind of weaving it into the fabric of, of industry to transform industries and also enrich lives. And um, was really uh, thankful to have worked on some amazing projects in the, the AI domain that, that makes the earth and, and enriches humanity uh, for the better. Well, great. Thank you very much for joining me. And I'm excited for the conversation like I teased. We're going to be talking about more of the good side of AI as opposed to maybe some of the stuff that ekes its way into the media that maybe makes us afraid of the technology. So you mentioned your experience in the past working in the industry on a whole host of different projects. And what I'd like to do is start by tapping your brain for a couple of examples of projects that you've worked on that are helping to support kind of the health of the world and the ecosystem that we live in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's really, yeah, not maybe not surprisingly, a tremendous amount of projects where we can actually help um, the environment with AI. Um, there's there's three that I, I would like to kind of maybe talk about a little bit today. Is like one, um, it, as as you may know, and your your viewers may know, um, you know, it's anticipated that up to seventy percent of the world's coral reefs could be destroyed without um, taking action by 2050. And um, as we know, about a quarter of marine life is dependent upon the health of those coral reefs. So there's a massive impact to the health of the earth um, and our ecosystems as a byproduct of that. And um, I worked on a project um, in the Philippines with um, a partnership through Accenture, uh, Intel, and an environmental association, Suobaya, where we actually deployed artificial intelligence um, underwater in an enclosure with a camera to detect the, the health of the coral reef and um, sent that data back on a ruggedized gateway on an island and then ultimately into the cloud. And we were able to classify the fauna surrounding the coral reef um, to determine its, its ongoing health. And why that's kind of interesting in material is traditional mechanism to do that would be to send a diver into the water and um, divers cannot monitor 24 seven. So they get a, a smaller sample size. Divers are actually expensive, especially if you look at, you know, the remote nature of coral reefs and um, the divers also kind of scare um, a lot of the, the fish. So you get a, a less accurate read uh, of the coral reef. So the continuous monitoring of a health of a coral reef. So you can take action is significantly improved by using kind of an underwater AI camera and um, and that that associated technology. And so that's one, I think, great example. The other um, example I want to talk about is actually kind of the opposite end of the spectrum is, is deploying AI um, in space. And um, as you may know, there's, there's a lot of satellites that take um, hyperspectral images of Earth and um, in doing so, they, they can send those images to climatologists. And one of the challenges that you find is the bandwidth um, from Earth to, or from space to those climatologists on Earth is, is quite uh, limited. And so AI, we can actually deploy AI in a satellite to identify which images are more pertinent for those climatologists on Earth. And um, why that's really interesting is fast moving weather patterns, you know, or forest fires, those, those images can be detected and prioritized. So climatologists can give early warning to populations um, and obviously um, get out in front of some of those challenges and events like forest fires and fast moving storms. And then the kind of third one, I think, you know, all near and dear to, to all of our hearts is these, these incredible, these incredible mammals that exist. And, um, 
you, you may know that about 35,000 elephants are poached every year. And it's not just poaching is not limited to just elephants, you know, you know, gorillas and lions and other incredible animal, animals are poached. And we've got all these great reserves um, to try to maintain the health of these populations, but they're, they're you know, poachers exist and they, it's very challenging to um, secure all of that mass area. And so what artificial intelligence allows us to do is detect um, poachers uh, not using human-based monitoring, which, you know, is very expensive 24 seven experience. And you can just send alerts when a camera sees a poacher enter a certain region, um, thereby preventing that act of poaching or allowing the local officials to address it uh, after they've taken some bush meat as well, um, thereby kind of maintaining the health of some of these, these incredible species. And so those are three, three examples that I was thrilled at and, um, many more I could actually talk about as well. Well, I'm going to tap into a little bit of that, but maybe switching from the environmental and kind of ecosystem centric component and focusing a little bit more in on being egotistical and looking at the human aspect of how we can use these technologies for good. So can you share maybe another handful of examples that you have of how this technology is supporting human populations and the, the better of our society? Yeah, I think, you know, kind of the, the onset of, of, you know, humans is, is really that, that moment of, of birth. And um, so just give you one, one example of that is, um, you know, we, we actually worked with, with, with Samsung to develop AI in, integrated into ultrasound technology that measures the fetal position of the baby when it's exiting the womb. And I think, as you know, um, both, you know, the fetal position and the exit uh, angle is very important to, to the health um, of the baby and mom throughout that pregnancy. And so get, using artificial intelligence to be able to get give doctors additional information and get them the data that they need to react better. So, you know, both mother and baby are successful through that transition is, I think, a really cool use of, of um, artificial intelligence. And we, we similarly work with um, Samsung in a different solution around um, identification um, of deployment of anesthesia. And obviously finding veins uh, can be hard and the accuracy of anesthesia is critically important uh, for many procedures. And so same thing with artificial intelligence and ultrasound technology, you can um, in provide anesthesiologists additional information on, on how they can uh, find those right veins to um, deploy that anesthesia. And another great example um, in, in the healthcare uh, domain is um, making sure that the patients were safe from this COVID-19 based pathogen. And um, I think we've, we've seen this in incredible technology in, in AI and robotics. And we actually worked on a deployment where we used artificial intelligence um, to build a robot that came in and used ultraviolet light um, to actually clean patients' rooms so that you know nurses and other medical professionals could avoid those rooms until they were um, they were clean and, and thereby you know reduce the spread of that pathogen. Um, and kind of one one other fun example um, more on the the AI at scale is one of the challenges I think you find. Um, when, when you want to solve big medical problems is you need really massive data sets um, while staying compliant with medical privacy laws such as HIPAA. And so we actually worked on a, on a project in the federated learning space um, whereby you're able to anonymize data, um, keep it at its secure location, but actually um, build new data sets um, that take the insights from information like cervical cancer and um, apply new methodologies to treat uh, cervical cancer using, using these concepts. And so that's another um, kind of example of a fun environment where I think AI has, has the ability to um, improve you know, human uh, lifespan uh, for the better as well. It is so exciting to be on the cusp of so much of this stuff and, and these technologies coming in to really truly improving health outcomes for people I work with a couple of different companies that are doing some really incredible things with diagnostics and treatment recommendations and that kind of thing in, in the health sciences realm. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that I kind of 
get a little too like geeky excited about when I start to see this stuff come out. Um, but one thing that I do want to kind of take a second to stop on is through all of those examples, those were all wonderful examples of how AI can help drive forward outcomes, but there were also a number of different subsets that are kind of, that were brought up in different types of technology that you mentioned in, um, in those answers. Would you mind taking a second to maybe dive into from your perspective, like what does the AI ecosystem look like with these different subsets of technology and kind of how do they all fit together? Yeah, and I think this is, you know, kind of a, a common, um, you know, challenge that we all face is the, the taxonomy of AI and the kind of pervasiveness of the term. Um, and so, like, I like to think about it in the, con like, simply in, in the context of, like, a, a Russian nesting doll where, you know, traditionally AI um, is, you know, intended to be the overall encompassing uh, technology that reflects, you know, the, the human-based ability to learn and computers replicating that human-based intelligence. Whereas um, machine learning is traditionally kind of a subset of that artificial intelligence where machines are actually able to, you know, train themselves on a data set um, and thereby apply intelligence based on that, that trained data set. Kind of more recently, and what's been kind of transformative, I think, to, to all these technologies that I alluded to um, was the advent of deep learning, um, where we in integrated techniques to really reflect the neurons in the human brain and the parallelization uh, of this learning concept um, that kind of dramatically improves um, artificial intelligence as we've historically known it. Um, and this is where we've seen things like convolutional neural networks exceed the capability of the human eye to actually, um, you know, see and, and, and ingest information. And so that's that's really where we're seeing a lot of the, the transformation. And I think there, there's always going to be emerging subsets um, of these technologies. Even for example, um, recently, if folks are familiar with with, with some of the the announcements around um, OpenAI and GTP three. And those technologies that they're they're using a lot of technologies that include like convolutional neural networks to create things like transformers for natural language processing. And so there's there's always going to be different kind of permutations that um, data scientists uh, will come up with over time. But I think it's important to kind of understand that nesting doll approach to, to AI and machine learning and deep learning really being kind of the, the transformational inflection point for us today and, and deploying a lot of this really cool um, technology that can have a positive impact on, on humanity and transform industries alike. Great. So we might not all joining the call have the ability to work on projects that have quite the same scale of what you were talking about before. Um, but can you give us some tips or suggestions of maybe how as individuals we can start leveraging these technologies to start making an impact in the world? Yeah, I think, you know, num number one, um, I think it's important to not to kind of start with the technology um, and say, hey, I want to go, you know, do something in the deep learning space. But what technologists get really passionate about is solving an industry problem. And so, you know, for, for everybody in their current jobs, I think the most important thing they can do is understand what the biggest challenges in their industries are, what the opportunities are for, for transformation and automation and efficiency and, you know, communicate and enlist others in that journey of solving those incredible problems. And it may be something like, like, you know, deep learning that, that solves that challenge, or it may be a traditional OCR approach um, that, that solves that problem. And so I think, I think like number one, I think just contextualizing the problem and enlisting others in that journey to solve that problem, you'll find that the technologists will be extremely passionate about that. I think the second thing to think about is, um, Whereas some of us get paralysis when we hear about these terms and um, it seems really, you know, confusing um, and, and intimidating, really, um, there's an incredible set of tools today um, and training today that, you know, anybody can learn. And you, you may, your, your viewers may be familiar with, you know, no code or, or low code based technologies and solutions, but a lot of AI is being built for, for people that work in line of business um, as, as data analysts or marketers. And, you know, these auto ML solutions um, are trying to extract that coding experience 
um, and the requirements to be a coder and just focus on the business problems that you want to solve and learn these tools. And there's these incredible platforms, um, like platforms like Audacity that build nano degrees and the latest, greatest technologies in this space as well. And so, you know, I, I encourage everybody not to be intimidated, but, um, you know, go, go learn these incredible new tools, you know, take a course. Um, there's never been a better time to learn these technologies. Um, and there's never been a lower barrier to entry um, of these technologies as well. Um, so th those would be kind of my, my two, you know, top of mind initiatives around doing a great job of enlisting others in the journey by creating a, a great business problem context, and then not being personally intimidated to, to learn about the underlying technologies. And, you know, of course, you know, reach out to Emma and, um, you know, challenge her to help out and, you know, and, and address your business problem as well, because I'm sure she's got a big network of people. Uh, Keep me on my toes there, why don't you? <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me and talk through this scene. I want to encourage everybody that's watching to make sure that you make your way over to his LinkedIn, follow him there. He's got some really great content that he's put out on his own on some of these ideas that we talked about today. And then when the company comes out of stealth mode, maybe you'll be the, one of the first people to find out as well with us um, if you're following him. But thank you so much for joining me and thank you everybody for watching and have a wonderful day. Thanks for having me, Emma. If you're looking for expert tips on how to get started with your transformation or looking to hone in on your approach, make sure that you subscribe to our channel to catch our weekly digital transformation talk series where we interview experts from around the world on how to make it happen.